Hi everybody! Welcome back to Paleontologist Rank, the Dinosaur Designs of Jurassic World Evolution 2. This week, we're looking at yet another Ceratopsian, because apparently we go in streaks. Uh, this is better than the Ornithomimosaur streak, to be sure. I hope there's a streak of better dinosaurs soon. But is it better than the pterosaur streak? The South American pterosaur streak? I don't know. Let us know in the comments. Yes, please tell us. Engage with our content. We desperately need you to. Before we get into it and talk about the dinosaur that we just saw trundled by the camera, <laughs> completely, completely what could it be? oblivious to what we have here, I'm told that we should introduce ourselves in case there is a new viewer in the audience. We have no evidence of this, but there might be one. And if you are a new viewer, thanks for clicking. I'm Dr. James Napoli. I am a postdoctoral research scholar at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences and North Carolina State University. My name is Amelia Zietlow. I'm a PhD candidate at the American Museum of Natural History. I'm Scott Johnston. I am the vertebrate paleontology fossil preparator and technician at the Harvard University Museum of Comparative Zoology. I'm Alex Rubenstall, and I'm here to say <laughs> that I'm a PhD candidate at Yale University. And I'm Dalton Meyer. I'm also a PhD candidate at Yale University. And together, we're the skeleton, We're the skeleton, We're the skeleton, skeleton, skeleton crew. crew. Scott, I know. I James know. and I it's had always it. me. We we were we were almost there, Dalton. We're the skeleton crew. Oh. <laughs> now just mouth along if you don't know. <laughs> All right, so Dalton, uh, the reveal of the animal has been spoiled by both the initial part of this video and the thumbnail and the title. And the title. <laughs> um, but why don't you show the audience what we're looking at today? And let's watch it enter Jurassic Park. Certainly. Oh, that's a really these are some really good color variants coming out. Oh, I really like these. This looks like a kind beast. There's kind yeah, of. Do you remember in, in the last video where I said that it and the Ceratops wasn't my favorite Ceratops scene in the game? Mm -hmm. is this this is my favorite Ceratops scene in the game. Interesting. It's really good. It is good. He's a good guy. He's a good boy. Yeah. So, Taurosaurus, where to be? There's a lot to talk about. Oh, there there's a, a ton to, to talk about. Um, where do we where do we start with this this beautiful animal? Well, so here's one thing to start with. What does its name mean? Because we're gonna try to start doing this. Well, well, that's a question that's hard to answer because the etymology of Taurosaurus, I think, has never really been like elaborated upon. Wait, it, it, there's debate whether it's just bull lizard? That's yeah, it doesn't not mean, the spelling of it, bull. It doesn't mean bull lizard. I'm dyslexic. I it can't apparently tell. apparently means perforated lizard. And I remember I went on it. That's what Wikipedia says. It means perforated lizard. And I went on like a, a Wikipedia Google Translate fucking rabbit hole to figure out how that name means that. And uh, I couldn't. I couldn't figure it out. It's apparently in reference to the holes in the frill, the fenestra. Um, but okay, the life so, of me, I could never find a yeah. source. Well, I think I'm looking this up right now. I think it has the same etymology. No, it doesn't. Never mind. I thought it Is might it... have the same etymology of, as the word Taurus, T-O-R-U-S, like a, a donut shape in math. Mm. But uh, so I thought that maybe that referred to there being a big hole in it, but it so, doesn't. It, so that, does... that, that means swelling in Latin, which is a Is good word to know. Is it close to the spelling for Toro? Or bull, or whatever. Well, Toro, tor like in that context, it's T A U R. Oh yeah. Oops, I'm so going to I'm going to posit something, which is that Sagan is misspelled. <laughs> it is. Could it just be that someone was like, "This is the bull lizard," and spelled it like that, and this came out in 1923, and at the time, like, racism was so racism that like. Even no. white Spaniards were. <laughs> March named this in 1891, um, and it was before they put etymologies in paper. So does this it's mean? Not, but it's not the both. Movie. Does this mean that the director of the previous Oscar-winning animated movie Pinocchio is? Guillermo the Perforated, because I don't like that. No, that's his <laughs> name is Spanish, where Toro for bull is spelled that way. God, I can't nope. spell. I'm okay. sorry, but I'm explaining that to the audience who can. So, so 
James, go for it. All right. No, 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 Dalton, you go for it. I'm looking back at the Wikipedia now, and I'm reading another part of it. It says, the name Taurosaurus is frequently tor- frequently translated as bull lizard from the Latin noun Taurus or the Spanish Toro, but much more likely is derived from the Greek verb toreo, which means to pierce or perforate, as an allusion to the fenestre in the elongated frill. Much of the confusion over the etymology of the name results in the fact that Marsh never explicitly explained it in his papers. So it's really great that the first time we're trying to like make an effort to explicitly say, ah, oh, here's what the name means. We don't really know. Well, because in Marsh's <laughs> day, everybody who was able to read also somehow spoke Latin and Greek. And they would read yeah. that and be like, ah, oh, yes, the perforated lizard. Yeah. Well, and yeah, not they'd, they'd read it and be like, either this is the perforated lizard or a misspelling of the Latin bull lizard, both of which are valid for this animal. Well, I think it must be... Perforate. I think perforated lizard is more likely for one reason. I think this was named the same year Marsh named Triceratops. They're both 1891, right? Or they're close to each other. I guess what I'm saying is I think there were very few Ceratopsians known, yeah. and this might have been the first one that actually had finestrae. And so it might have struck Marsh as weird oh. that it had them. Rather than, as we now know, it's the rule to have them, and Triceratops is weird for not. According to my bullshit list that I... So it says Triceratops is 89 and Taurus yeah. is 91. Okay. Where's the so holo- that's close. Sorry to change topics slightly. Where's the holotype of Taurosaurus? Is it yeah, probably here? here? It's Yale. It Yale. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. One, one thing that I like about Taurosaurus is there are probably multiple species of it. Um, the first one was Taurosaurus lattice, which means the wide. Which is it's perforated and wide. <laughs> it's wide, wide, the hole. wide. <laughs> It'd be a good species wide name for about sixty percent of our group. <laughs> <laughs> I prefer. Hey, give me robustus at least. Okay, I'm, I'm, okay I'm, I'm not fat. I'm just robustus bone. <laughs> exactly. I'm not fat. I'm just lattice. Um, so, so it's the why. <laughs> Tactically why. <laughs> Tactically why. I like Steven Seagal. <laughs> I'm sorry, I can't take credit for that. That was that was Felix from Chapel. Oh, that was so good. I mean, Steven Seagal is tactically why <laughs> <laughs> to keep terrorists from getting past. So for the Russian military. Oh, oh God, I'm gonna throw up. Okay, I'm sorry. So there, there's also a species from Utah <laughs> called Taurosaurus utahensis, which is much less. Um, I'm picturing fun. it with big, colorful fucking circles on his chest. Steven Seagal? Yeah, like a Taurosaurus frill. Okay. Okay, I'm better. I'm better. Okay. okay. Okay, and then there was a third species that Marsh <laughs> named that had my favorite name, which was Taurosaurus gladius, which mm. referred to the... Ooh. Right, and they're, and everybody's like, that one's invalid. No! I refuse to lose it. I will make it real again. It's, it's like how I'm constantly sad that of all of the species of Stegosaurus that we have, the one that's like is invalid is Stegosaurus armatus. Because, like, what a name! Yeah, yeah it, it's it's just so sad. Um, I'm pulling up a paper about it again. Uh, so, yeah. So anyway, Taurosaurus uh, is known from a number of specimens. It's not nearly as common as Triceratops, though. There We've are... made kind of a um, an inverse of what we see in the Hell Creek in this enclosure, which is that we have tons of, tricer- or tons of Taurosaurus and, like, three Triceratops. Whereas it's kind of the other way around in terms of what we see in the fossil record, at least. Or the fossils we find, I should say. Not necessarily reflective of the true biodiversity, but... Right. And, and, and I guess this is a good time to mention that Taurosaurus is from the Hell Creek Formation. But it's also from other places. Mm-hmm. Um, Taurosaurus is a rare example of a dinosaur from Western North America that's kind of seen along a north-south gradient. There's remains attributable to it, I think, as far south as New Mexico and Texas, but I I might be wrong about that. There's bits in the Ojo Alamo formation that are called, like, Taurosaurus something. Or just, like, indeterminate Taurosaurus. 
They're also from the Javelina Formation, according to uh, the Long Ridge and Field paper, which we'll get into more later, obviously. Hmm. Um, so yeah, it's known from a north-south gradient. One of the only other things that appears to be is actually T. rex itself. There's not a lot of material from the southern U.S., but there is some that seems to be T. rex in, like, Texas. Triceratops, as far as I know, is pretty much restricted to northern North America. As far We've as never know. found it elsewhere. And it's possible that's an incompleteness thing, but given how common it is, there there is some temptation to regard it as a real signal. Um, yeah. In any case, Taurosaurus and Triceratops live together. And I saw beleaguered because, sigh. And now we have to talk about ontogeny. Ontogeny. Oh, smack! Oh, I love that. That's what I. Oh, yeah. uh, that's I great. love that. Such a good animation. This is a good opportunity for me to once again talk fondly about the Taurosaurus mount at the Milwaukee Public Museum, which is what the museum I grew up going to and um, has obviously had an impact on me. Uh, and that's the specimen I think I've referred to in two other videos now, the one last week and the probably the Triceratops one that has the puncture in the side of its frill, uh, presumably made by the horn of another Taurosaurus. Very cool. It's a beautiful specimen. It's not too shabby either, right? No, no, it's like it's not terribly complete, but it's pretty it's post crania and skull, and I am like ninety percent sure it's all one specimen, uh, which as we've also talked about is not necessarily common among older museum mounts. Um and yeah, just to, to talk again, to talk fondly about the Milwaukee Public Museum, um it is at the entrance to I believe it's called the Third World is it th third planet third planet exhibit which is our um kind of evolution through time exhibit so you start off with the taurosaurus and then it kind of goes back into like geologic time and you look at volcanoes and different rocks and go through they've got like a cave diorama that you walk mm -hmm. through and then a nice a beautiful cambrian aquarium-esque diorama and then of course the iconic mpm uh t-rex standing over i believe it's a triceratops actually in the mount it might be a yeah, no, I believe it's a Triceratops in the um, diorama. That's all, you know, it's got its guts spilling out and everything. It's a really, really, really lovely diorama. Very immersive. Um, I have memories of going to the museum on a field trip in kindergarten and being upset that we wouldn't go into the dinosaur room because other kids were afraid of it. And I was upset about this because I couldn't believe that these other children didn't understand that this is a fake diorama and that it was not real. And oh my God, how stupid could they be? Uh, but anyways, uh, and so the Taurosaurus exhibit, part of it, too, that's really fun is they've got two uh, chunks of bone. I don't believe they're part of the Taurosaurus, but they have a cast like leg bone and a real leg bone that you can spin to see like the cast is much lighter than, you know, the real bone. And they also, I believe, in that exhibit have a little uh, digression about were they sprawling or were they upright? Because the exhibits are kind of old. So at the time, I don't think we really knew the answer. And I think was it in Triceratops that we talked about that, that we still don't really kind of 100% know the answer? Or do we? I don't remember. We uh, talked about it in Trike. Yeah, I think yeah. we're, I would say we're like getting to like 85% certain that it's pretty upright, but there's but, lingering yeah. questions about like exact posture and how that might have been achieved. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Um. But anyway, it's, yeah, so that this, this animal is very special to me because that museum in that place is very special to me. Um. Yeah, no, I could I could go on and on and on about the Milwaukee Public Museum, but we we are not here to talk about that. We're here to talk about Taurosaurus. And, and talk about him, we shall. Sorry, Alex. Just a ahead. tiny bit off of uh, Amelia, kind of while this is the framing of the conversation about Taurosaurus, yeah. it should be noted that the Peabody also has a very yeah. visible uh, bit of of Taurosaurus in outside on Whitney Avenue. If you're walking, mm. along all the of our viewers who are walking through New Haven daily uh, through through the Cretaceous <laughs> Garden that currently is being replanted but there's a huge life-size i think it's brass or it's bron yeah, it's brass bronze yeah bronze bronze uh bronze yeah. torosaurus on a huge piece of granite um which actually comes from a quarry in connecticut um and it's very cool mm -hmm. uh it's kind of, it's you know the, they used to have an exhibit in the museum and i don't know if they still will but all about how they reconstructed it what inspiration they took from living organisms for its scales and stuff um there are choices in it i don't necessarily agree with uh the doesn't have really any cheeks and the quenai are birds but beyond that it is very cool and really quite imposing and quite fantastic 
I can't Alex, believe they got the roof of its mouth wrong. We don't you know the thing of not to look a gift triceratops in the mouth? <laughs> All you'll yeah. find there is pain. I, I I love that model. I also think the model was explicitly stated to be Taurosaurus gladius, which is valid to me. And <laughs> honestly, I, I love it. It carries on a proud Peabody tradition of, you know, when if someone's like, this isn't valid, we're, we're like, yes, it is. <laughs> <laughs> the yes. only mounted Brontosaurus, baby. <laughs> I thought you were going to say it carries on the Peabody tradition of very emphasized cloacas because it does have it does have it's and you know it was ahead of its time. That's we found true. out. Cetacosaurus, juicy cloaca, Taurosaurus. <laughs> right. <laughs> All right. So should we talk about ontogeny now? Ontogeny. Ontogeny. So. Uh, I'll lead into this. So. Taurosaurus entered a lot of public consciousness in 2010 because a paper was published by Jack Horner and John Scanella, both at the Museum of the Rockies. I think the paper was the result of John Scanella's PhD research. Like, I think that was the main thrust of it, um, where they did histological sectioning on some Triceratops and Taurosaurus fossils. And I should note that Jack Horner really like was one of the people leading the charge with using osteohistology to study dinosaur evolution and paleobiology. And it's a really important method. And what yeah. they've found through a lot of that work is the, the gateway into a lot of my research, which I'll talk about on the channel more at a later date. But they essentially realized that most dinosaur fossils we have are not skeletally mature. And when they looked at Triceratops, they found that none of them were skeletally mature. They had not stopped growing but that the couple of Taurosaurus that had been found, which are all larger than any adult Triceratops, were done growing. And so based on this and other observations of like thinning of the uh, frill in the region where the Fenestra and Taurosaurus are and Triceratops during growth, they proposed that Triceratops was the juvenile form and subadult form of Taurosaurus. Now Triceratops was named in 19, or I'm sorry, not 19, 1899, 1889, 1889. And Taurosaurus was named in 1891. So actually what would have happened is that Taurosaurus would have not been valid anymore. The press... I know a... Oh, sorry. Go well, on. I was going to say the press reported it as there's no such yeah. thing as Triceratops. That's which... what I was going to say. You... Right. Yeah, you and that it. bothered a lot of people, including me, because first I was like, what do you mean? D you will not take her from me. I got and so many like questions 15. about that. Yeah. Yeah, I was 15, right? but I was, well, I mean, I was following the science. Like, I, I've been a dork about Fair this enough. since I was two. Uh, same I and kind of same. I saw a lecture from, from Jack Horner about it, probably in 2010 or 2009, like right before the paper came out, where he's like, hey, like, Taurosaurus is just the, the adult form of Triceratops. And, and also, some other ontogeny things were discussed, including like Tyrannosaurus and Pachycephalosaurus. So, right. It was, yeah, it was interesting. And I remember also being very frustrated by people being like, oh, Triceratops didn't exist. Like, no, Taurosaurus didn't exist. I remember having yeah. some friends and like teachers and stuff asking asking me after that came out. They was just like, hey, genuinely, like, Scott, what is this I'm hearing? Is this true? So this was not the first in the ontogenetics anonymizations that have happened over time in dinosaur paleo. But I think it was kind of the lightning rod. So mm -hmm. obviously prior to this debate had started over, you know, whether Nano Tyrannus was the juvenile of T-Rex or not. And that had kind of faded a little bit by this point with the consensus reaching that it was a juvenile T-Rex. But this wave of papers really actually started in 09 with um, Goodwin's paper that Horner was also an author on about pachycephalosaurs, mm. where they argued that... Yeah. Draco Rex and Stiggy Moloch were juveniles of Pachycephalosaurus based on the same line of evidence that St Draco Rex and Stiggy Moloch were juveniles. Pachycephalosaurus was an adult. Same time, same place. They're juveniles of that. I didn't realize that paper came out first because I guess I saw all that information kind of presented at once. So I thought that the Taurosaurus came out first. But interesting. It was the year prior and I don't know the months. Of huh. It could have only been a few. I months. think it was close. Yeah. And it was kind of a big, like big moment. And I remember that being really when I started hearing more about the nano Tyrannus debate as well. I think that kind of brought Same. it back to the media yeah. forefront. We're like, you know, Jane had been discovered. A lot of the debate had already happened. I, and the field had mostly settled on it being a juvenile rex, obviously, with the holdouts. But, like, I think that's kind of when the fact that there was a debate 
came to my attention. Started, started Same. I, 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 I kind of, I, I kind of remember like around that time that it was kind of like a bunch of these things coming out that were essentially like, Hey, welcome to the hell Creek where everything is a juvenile of something else. Mm -hmm. So the main debate that a lot of people in the paleo online sphere today are th like, think about and have talked about is the whole Nana Tyrannus juvenile Rex debate. And that's because that's the one that has continued to get the most attention because theropods get a lot of popular interest and they attract a lot of crackpots. <laughs> However, the method that has been, or the, not the method. However, the actual ontogenetic question that's gotten the most research published about it and I think that we have a definitive answer on is Taurosaurus being the adult form of Triceratops. Um, so a few years after the original paper was published, uh, researchers Nick Longrich and Dan Field in 2012 published a rebuttal to Scanella and Horner's original paper. And Amelia here, I turn it over to you. Right. Right, yeah. So um, in this paper, basically, uh, the purpose of this was to throw some new methods at this question, some new statistics. Um, and so the paper does a good job about going into the background of the question, um, laying out what's been done previously, showing what the two skulls look like next to each other, and also showing distribution of where different specimens assigned to each species or each genus have been found. Um, so like we mentioned earlier, there are a couple localities... Uh, more southern localities where only Taurosaurus are found. There's one northern locality where there's only Triceratops, but basically for the rest of the western interior, they overlap everywhere. Um, and speaking from experience, from I, I've done fieldwork in Montana, we find both of them. Um, although, like we said earlier, Triceratops is more common. Um, but anyways, so one of the new methods that they threw at this question was cladistic analysis of ontogeny. Um, and so basically how this method is supposed to work is that you create a data set of hypothetical growth characters that you assign to each individual specimen. So for each individual specimen, you're assessing which features of it are relatively immature or relatively mature in the context of that data set. And you feed this data set into a computer algorithm that then sorts um, these specimens. If you think about an evolutionary tree, they're basically small, specific groups nested within larger, more general groups. And with the ontogenetic analysis, how it's supposed to work is that the these small, specific groups are actually more mature um, growth stages. So as you progress up the tree, you're progressing from less mature to more mature. Um, and the analysis is also telling you what characters or what traits these different levels of maturity have in common. So you're basically getting a sequence of growth changes as the animal matures. So the reason that this um, was used in this paper, uh, what they were expecting to find if this hypothesis of Taurosaurus being the adult form of Triceratops was supported, you would expect to find all of the Triceratops towards, for a minute, I forgot which one was supposed to be young. Um, so what they were expecting to find if it was supported that Taurosaurus is the adult version of Triceratops, you would find all the Triceratops specimens kind of... Um, along the bottom of the tree and as the tree progressed and like towards the um as you progressed along the tree towards the top you'd get and there were more mature specimens that these would be taurosaurus so you'd get this grade of triceratops into taurosaurus mm -hmm. and that's not what they found um they found taurosaurus specimens scattered all over the tree mm -hmm. in different places among the different tricer among different triceratops specimens and so what that is suggesting is that they are really two species kind of in this that are mixed together in this data set um because the tree did not recover this sequence of change from triceratops to taurosaurus right and, and so one other line of evidence they bring about like in addition to that which is pretty damning to the hypothesis because they're finding triceratops as being equivalently mature mm -hmm. is that the initial statistics done by Scanella and horner auto correlated their variables so very what simply because mean? none of you guys are math alex calls me a math bitch and i <laughs> i love that title because it's unfortunately who i am um i took calc one three times i'm not a math bitch uh, yes <laughs> But I am. So you are math bitch. The <laughs> oh, incredibly so. <laughs> so. So the. So uh, am I. Don't worry. Yeah. Well. So, and ma if math is my bitch, then by extension, Scott, you're also my bitch. <laughs> yes, it's the, it's yeah. a transitive property. It's math. It's a transitional a transitive property of bitchness, <laughs> bitchitude. 
<laughs> so autocorrelation of variables refers to accidentally doing your statistics in a way where a variable is on both sides of the equation, so to speak. A fundamental assumption of almost every statistical test, whether you're doing like a t-test or a regression or something, anything like that, is that your variables are independent. In the case of this study, there was a pretty, um, it's a pretty common mistake, but it is one that affects the analysis, wherein they regressed, and I'm checking this to make sure I don't say anything wrong, which is why I'm speaking more slowly now. They plotted the ratio of the length of the squamosal bone to its width against the length of the squamosal bone. So the length of the squamosal is both on the y-axis of the graph and on the x-axis, which means that it's entering both terms. And when you do a regression on that to try to see what the relationship is, it's being affected mostly by the, by the length of the squamosal. It's autocorrelated. And so Longrich and Fields correctly pointed that out as a problem in the original paper that, you know, you can't have the same variable on both axes. This is done a lot of the time inadvertently when people want to express something as a ratio of something else and then fail to find an independent variable to compare it to, um, which could be like total skull length or femur length or something like that, something that isn't the exact same mathematical term being mm -hmm. entered again. Um, the other problem that they found is that the outliers in that regression analysis were actually all Taurosaurus individuals, which would indicate that Taurosaurus is not even fitting the model that they reported, mm. which is mostly consistent with that being a separate species. Now, I, I want to caution the reader that you can't just like look at a graph and determine that the statistics are wrong based on like what the outliers are. But the, if there's structure to the outliers, it's usually indicative of there being some sort of systemic problem with the analysis. Where, like, outliers should be more random. If all of the outliers are belonging to one class, there's something going on there. And, and so the combination of the cladistic ontogeny results with the statistical results, or the statistical reevaluation that Longrich and Field did, made it look pretty uh, compelling that Taurosaurus is a distinct species. Um, I will say that this is also supported by some of my unpublished work on ontogeny and living animals. Uh, but on most Tom excitingly, Jimmy. on Tom Jimmy, and most excitingly, was recently backed up by the fossil record itself, doing a thing that it doesn't always do and providing us the evidence we need to answer a question. <laughs> um, oh. Jordan Mallon, I think it was 2022, uh, was part of a team of researchers. I think the lead author was one of his students, but they have what appears to be a juvenile Taurosaurus. And it's diagnosably Taurosaurus. It's not Triceratops. And so that can officially kind of wrap it up. It's not like we haven't had small Taurosaurus specimens. Like when I was at, I was visiting the Perot uh, Museum a couple weeks ago, they have a cast of, I believe, one of the Yale specimens. And like, that's a relatively small individual. Like it's smaller than most Triceratops. And it already has, you know, I mean, not already because they don't change, but it has the holes in the frill and, you know, the other diagnostic features mm -hmm. of, the, of the clade. Yeah, some of some of ours here seem pretty small, and then <clears throat> additionally, discovered in Thornton, Colorado, not you know probably an, an hour away from where I grew up, and it was on display at the Denver Museum for a time. They have a specimen they've nicknamed Tiny, the Taurosaurus, and it's mm -hmm. also it's not a baby, but it's uh, it's smaller than many of the Triceratopses that I've seen. I've heard yeah. of that one, yeah, and I, it's and a beautiful I... specimen. Right. right. Well, and also, like we were talking, I think the last video about how there's not much, there hasn't been many studies done on ceratopsy and postcrania. And like we say, we find a lot of triceratops in the Hell Creek. What we really find are a lot of vertebrae and frill chunks that may or may not have the edges of the fenestra in them and like limb chunks. Mm -hmm. And like, I don't know to, to what extent people have actually looked into the variation or lack thereof in the postcrania of these guys. Because like looking at the Longridge paper, Longridge and Field paper, um, all the pictures and diagrams they have of are, are of skull characters. Anyway, the end result is it looks like Taurosaurus is distinct from Triceratops, which is why they're separate in this game, and it's why they're separate on our list. Does anybody want to talk about the scales on its back? Yeah. Um, yeah it's... I've actually been... So in, while you guys were talking about that, in looking at the model, uh, 
I, I know that I brought up in the Triceratops video that specifically the Jurassic Park skin has those, again, what I only ever see referred to as nipple scales mm -hmm. on it. That, I mean, it's kind of what it says on the tin. It's just kind of what they look like. It's a very apt name. And Taurosaurus, they, they kind of seem to have cranked that to 11 a little bit. From what I've seen of the reconstructions of derived Ceratopsian skin, these were present, but I haven't seen them be either A, this large and this pronounced where they almost look like osteoderms or B, uh, this regular and paired that um, if we look on, on the flank of one, that they kind of look a bit more like random splotchy mm -hmm. along the sides. And that seems to be kind of more in line with the current thinking of how they would have looked in life. And as it goes like, kind of over the sacrum and down onto the tail, especially, uh, they look way more like actual, like paired osteoderms, like we would see in a thyreophorin. And I don't believe we have any evidence for that. And I would probably even hang my hat on saying that, like, that's probably not what it looked like, mm -hmm. but I'm happy that they have them in here. Yeah. And I've also, uh, let's open up this can of worms. I've heard some people make the assumption, uh, make the, the, not the assumption, make the hypothesis and also reconstruct the animal this way that these nipple scales are, in fact, not just weird looking scales, but the basis for quills. They're not. Done. Yeah, they aren't. They aren't. If, we... they, if they had any kind of like quills, they would have had to have been coming like from the interstices of the scale or like non scalated patches of skin, but they're not emerging from the little, from the nipples. Thank Do we God. know? Think... <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, Amelia, you go ahead. Do we know, do, do we know where these originated from? Because there's that painting of, it's not Triceratops. It's the other thing by Charles Knight. Agathalmus. Yeah. I was just thinking that this might be a tribute to that, which I think, was oh. a high, like a mix of ceratopsian material and ankylosaur osteoderms, if I'm not mistaken. Right. Ooh. Yeah, no, and I wonder, because, like, also, I think, and I think I mentioned this in the Triceratops video, too. Like, I remember growing up, I had, like, this, a Triceratops, like, thing, like, figure that had those bumps on it. Like, this is, and this is, I would say, I guess it wasn't before the influence of Jurassic Park. It's not that old, but I feel like, I feel like, though, that, that vibe for the ceratopsians or at least for triceratops esque ceratopsians has been around for a while whether or not knight started it or someone else did i have no idea but it's especially also amelia because for that video um, i did i did do some looking up and that is a jurassic park toy is it really yeah it was like rubber and it scooched around and made a weird sound yep i i, I did some digging and it's a jurassic park toy yeah, and the scale pattern cool. is uh, like directly lifted from the Agathalmus painting for sure. Like, okay, yeah, yeah no, that's for cool. this one. No, not this one, but the, the like kind of polygonal the JP one ovoid scales. Yeah, that seems to be where it comes from. And I, I was just in the collections earlier today, looking at um, doing a tour for some for a class, and we have a cast of some Ceratopsian skin impression, and this side flank is pretty decent. Like you see a mosaic of small pebble scales and then large round feature scales like this. Um, and that makes sense. I am not unconvinced that these are supposed to be osteoderms, which is not correct, but um, I, I maybe think, they are scales. I, I mean, I think they might be in, like, because structurally they look pretty nipple scaly. Like they look a lot like the unpublished skin impressions that are known from Hatcher. Mm. Um, or not Hatcher, Lane. The, the other named one. Hatcher Hatcher's a different one. Um, but yeah, I think I, they're arranged like osteoderms and they're big enough and kind of darkly colored enough that I think that might be what they're like. I don't know if the artist necessarily knew that they were like that nipple scales are not big osteoderms because they kind of look like both to me. Um, well, yeah, yeah, it's like a Carnotaurus situation. Yeah. Well, well, right. I was going to bring that yeah. up where like we thought Carnotaurus had osteoderms on its body for a long time and it turns out they are not osteoderms. 
and big scales. And I, Scott mentioned before that he's willing to hang his hat on this arrangement not being correct for the feature scales. I'm inclined to agree because we know that Carnotaurus had feature scales and they are not symmetrically arranged. Mm. And and maybe what about um, Ceratosaurus? I don't. It has osteoderms. And they're parasagittal, right? Like yes. right. Well, yeah, well, it might. I don't know if it's two rows or one row. Or so it's either sagittal or parasagittal. Yeah. It's, so they're they're going down the back in a row. Yeah. I was gonna say that might be. I I don't know if this has to be the case, but it seems like it's shaping up like this. That when they're paired, like if they're osteoderms, they will be paired or a single row on the midline. That makes in, sense in a regular pattern. But if they're just big scales, they'll be more randomly yeah. dotted. Counterpoint. Diplodocus. Well, those are keratin. Yeah, but they're yeah, not. Idiot. But they're That's not osteoderms. osteoderms. I didn't and say they're if along they're, the I, I didn't say if they're on the midline that they're osteoderms. I said if they're osteoderms, they're on the midline or paired. Okay, Actually, sorry, in my brain. I, I might have. This. I might not have said that, but that's what I meant to say. Gotcha. While we're stun locked on this, <laughs> I would like to point out that the possibility of a quill emerging from weird scoots or scales on Taurosaurus is not completely without precedent. Um, based on the integument of Calindodromius. Do they have some that emerge from weird little scales? It appears that, okay. so there's there's a bit of a discussion, um, and it's been interpreted two ways. One of one way is that this is just a weird, mispreserved uh, kind of basal branching feather that has filamentous quills, and it just looks like a scale, or that it is kind of scaly with long, weird filaments yeah. coming off of it. Uh, I wish Kalindodromius was in this game because it's it is bizarre. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so not not impossible for for a structure like that to exist. I think there is good reason to suspect that the nipple scales aren't doing that. Sure, and I think I think you're correct in that if they had quills like Cetacosaurus, they would be emerging from the spaces between the scales. Yeah, which is certainly possible that, that they did. Right. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, I am not hostile to the idea of ceratopsians in general having having quills. I, I just, like, the nipple scales don't have a hole in them for the quill to come out of. And if they did, like, I, I, I bet we'll, we'll bring this up more in both the video on Packy Rhinosaurus in this game, and also definitely gonna mention it in, when we eventually talk about it in Prehistoric Kingdom. Uh, what are your feelings of woolly ceratopsians and stuff? So like, it's cute. cute but wrong. Yeah, yeah. So like, uh, maybe, probably. Well, not. I say nay. But probably not. But it's cute. I don't know. You get a Euteranus, you cover it. You get a high enough elevation. Apparently, they're shaggy dogs. Are you saying this is all pointless? There's one thing that I wish they did differently about this design in this game. I wish it were noticeably bigger than Triceratops. Yes. Yep. Yeah. They make it a little small. Uh, and I mean, this is part of a general pattern in which things in the movies are too big, like mm -hmm. uniformly. Except but, for a handful like, of things. Except like, for, this is probably right. a correct size for Taurosaurus. Right. If we had it next to a person, it would probably be correct, but it's well, not let like... let me put this in first person. I think it's a little small, but it's close. Hmm. <laughs> Yeah, it's hard to say. I wouldn't. I've there's I've seen some big triceratops. Yeah. Yeah, because yeah, tri triceratops like it's the scale of an elephant, and this is not. Yeah, it's okay, it's kind of elephant it's not scale. Far off. Pete, I think this is more rhino than elephant to me, though. Like, I mean, triceratops and torosaurus are some of the largest animals that have ever lived on land. Like, I mean, not because, I mean, rather, let me say that. They ain't sauropods. They're not sauropods. They're comparable to the largest mammals that have ever lived, with the exception of very large andricotheres. Like, they are absurdly big. Yeah, they're big. But this isn't, like, I mean, there were torosaurs of this size, I guarantee, because they probably got a little bigger than this, and so certainly this is a good torosaurus. Right. I do declare. I, I just wish that for the purposes of the game it would come out like noticeably larger and more showy than Triceratops because mm -hmm. like the frills on these things reach ten feet long. You know, we're talking well, about an the, animal like, the size of an African elephant. 
how would they do that? How would they? How would they? How would it come out of the hatchery like? You know, noticeably like, larger than triceratops. Are they going to release a, a triceratops <laughs> next to it and then for like scale and then they pull it back with a claw? The ranger <laughs> comes up behind, like right behind the frill at the base of the skull and oh. shoots it. It's like, all right, the comparison's done. You know what I mean. When they stand next to each other, if you put them in the same enclosure because you want the girls to fight, it, <laughs> like, I wish, I just wish it were bigger. I wish it were yeah. like a, a pretty yeah. conspicuously huge animal in the game rather than a correct size like everything that wasn't in the movies compared to the things that were in the movies and are kind of too big. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, this is also Taurosaurus. We didn't mention it yet, but that's, it's also a, a JPOG original. Yeah. It is. I loved it in Jurassic Park Operation Genesis. It was in all of my yes. parks. And it was I also it undersized was, there. It was real small. Yeah, it was tiny. Oh it was my a cute God. guy. We need to talk about this. The sleeping. Oh my God. Flute. It's tremendous. <laughs> it just I... scream froze when I, in, in, in my view, and now I can't see its flute. So. Uh, <sighs> it's one of my favorite like sleeping animations in the whole game. It's also correct because um, something that, or at least it's anatomically plausible, that it's something that uh, I had a point in my head to talk about in the previous video, but I guess I'll mention it here. Uh, if you go back and watch our Pentaceratops video um, and specifically look for when they're sleeping, but watch the whole video anyways because it makes us happy. Um, and money. And money. <laughs> Um, but mostly happy. Mostly um, happy. But so the Pentaceratops in this game uh, sleeps like you would expect, uh, sleeps in a manner that you would expect a large quadrupedal animal to do so. That like It kind of like throws its legs off to the side and kind of sits down with its torso facing forward with its front legs on the ground and then it just kind of curls up like that. Um, that level of rotation that you see in the pelvis and well in the spine right before the pelvis is something that dinosaurs cannot do. And it's a really, really common trope that we see in so many reconstructions of dinosaurs is seeing them laying down kind of like kangaroo do, where they have their legs off to one side, but they're still kind of facing forward. And the reason why... why I ah. <laughs> the, the reason why... Yes, yes. And so the reason why um, dinosaurs can't do that is because mammals have very specialized vertebrae that we specifically have a, a section between uh, where our ribs end and where our pelvis, the, the few section of vertebrae that attach to our pelvis begins called the lumbar vertebrae. It's normally the bit of your back that hurts when you start to get near pushing 30 like I am. Um, that's why I have a foam roller in my room. Oh, yay. It's great. But, uh, so that section of ribless vertebrae, besides just existing to cause me pain, exists to give us an extra, and us, I mean mammals, an extra level of rotational freedom between the trunk and the hips. So... The way that the Taurosaurus, so this is all to say, the way that the Taurosaurus lies down in this game uh, by just kind of like collapsing is not, you can be safe in the knowledge that that is not just adorable, but a solid bet as to how it just would have happened. Um, and this also goes for the way that uh, you'll hear us say that like, oh, Carnotaurus sits correctly as well. Same thing. That it just kind of... Many of the theropods in the down. game do, which is one of my favorite little details. It's more notable when it doesn't happen. Um, mm. but yeah, Allosaurus so, doesn't. Al in and Albertosaurus. And Albertosaurus, yeah. Mm -hmm. In regards to the lumbar, those lumbi verdes, uh, the I think just worth saying, so within mammals, right, like possibly why different things are happening, and, and interesting maybe, perhaps, that doesn't happen in Taurosaurus. So... Like that regionalization is believed to be related to several things. It's important uh, in kind of the springiness of a mammal while it runs. Mm -hmm. But also uh, it might have something to do with the diaphragm, uh, with how they breathe, um, which in mammals, 
including us, there's a big muscle that yanks. <laughs> so there's room for room for the lungs to fill with air. And all your viscera is uh, so in a person, right? Like you can feel it. You can that, feel the that, bottom that's of your such a case. wonderful explanation. I'm hearing my Mount Sinai anatomy professors just being like, ah, he got it. <laughs> you swoop and then you you and so in dinosaurs it's well so that's kind of where it's interesting in that because most dinosaurs it's not believe it, it is not believed they had a kind of diaphragm analog mm. except in ornithischians which might <laughs> so i don't the the ultimate what well, this was this was a shaggy dog story that went nowhere oh my god <laughs> it's I, already I, come I, back <laughs> so foreshadowing is a literary device well guess what else lived in the hell creek everybody oh my god <laughs> On Zoom. T-Rex. We're not going to watch it come out because we'll save that for, for when we do T-Rex, which won't be for a long time. It's Nano Tyrannus. What do you mean? It'll be completely random when we do T-Rex. <laughs> mm, that's right. Probably a Taurosaurus. Now, these are, they should be beefed up Taurosauruses and weaked up T-Rexes. So we might do so something. That was a good jab that got in. Damn. Oh, okay. okay. All right. I thought there was going to be a window shutdown sound there. I did too. <laughs> hey, come on. Fuck them up. Hey. hey. All right. We have. Is that our first successful herbivore defense? No, we oh. say that every time. But is it? No. It's the first no. Time no. Against T Rex, maybe. No. Triceratops killed a T Rex. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Right. Triceratops oh, killed a T-Rex. Forgot that video. Um, Hoyangosaurus uh, uh, survived against Metriacanthosaurus. Uh, Struthiomimus outran a. Uh, they outran it. I don't know if I call that. It won. That's a that's a win. Its genetic lineage considers it a win, so I consider sure. it a win. All right. Well, we've seen we've seen a good fight. There's also a Taurosaurus fighting the Triceratops in the background, so we got a double a two for one. Um, a twofer? A twofer. Let's take it to the species viewer now. Let's yeah. do that indeed. All right, Amelia, you go first. Just... Um, yes, as I've said a couple times now, I do really like Taurosaurus. <clears throat> I think the model's pretty good. I don't hate it. It's a lot better than Triceratops. Where do we have Triceratops? B. B. B? Good. Um, where do we have Styracosaurus and Pentaceratops? S. Styracosaurus is S, Pentaceratops is A. Uh, damn. Okay, that's not helping me. I'm gonna give it. I'm gonna give it an S because it gets everything right about Triceratops, that or like it gets everything right that Triceratops should have had to be like this is a cool large animal that would kill you, and they do a good job giving it pretty patterns and things. I'll give it an okay. S. Yeah, I'm gonna concur with Amelia. It's not quite as accurate anatomically as pentaceratops was with like the the feet are more elephanty and everything mm -hmm. so I'll, like that's the only thing i could ding it on i also haven't looked closely enough to know like how the skull profile differs from a real taurosaurus but the only thing i can really say is i think the frill is if anything understated yeah like taurosaurus yeah. especially large ones have huge frills we also didn't really get into it but one of the things that uh, apparently is a little bit notable about Taurosaurus is that it is a bit more uh, remarkably uh, individually variable. And that's probably just a factor of we have more of them. Right. So, so I mean, this is a really, this is a really good design. I like the colors. I like the way they made it imposing and fairly elegant while also being like powerful, but not like, I don't know. It's not, it very clearly maps with what we know of the real animal in many ways. The only anatomical criticisms I have are either they didn't go far enough or a very minor quibbles. I'm going to go with S. Oh, no, no. I'm being a contrarian. Uh, I'm going to go off off the bat. I'm going to go A. Um, I think it's really good, but... It doesn't bring me as much joy as Styracosaurus does. And that personally, actually, especially doing these back to back, I think I like Pentaceratops more, even though I do not like Pentaceratops to an S tier level. Um, 
I really, really like it. It's one of my favorite ser- favorite Ceratopsians in the game. Uh, it's just so, so, so well done. It just doesn't. It just doesn't tickle my fancy in the exact right way that I would give it an S. So what are you All giving? Right. An A. Oh, okay. I didn't know if you actually said that or not. I was like, are you in the no, ranking? It, no, I said it right off the bat. I was just like, I'm going to be contrarian. I'm giving it an A. And then I gave reasons. And despite Scott's dyslexia, he is, uh, he, 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 he chose the right letter. Um, because while I do like this more than Pentaceratops, uh, I like its, I like its fun little scales on its back. I like its colors. I like its tood. I do wish the frill was, uh, Longer, taller, I guess. That being said, it doesn't strike the platonic ideal of spiky horn uh, ceratopsid that Styracosaurus does for me, which is an S. So I'm going to say that this is a comfortable A tier ahead of Pentaceratops. I'm displeased because now I have the deciding vote. Comes down and to I'm you. torn. I was initially on the A team. I was. This is a solid A to be certain, at the very minimum. This is a very good design. It encapsulates Taurosaurus very well. It's a little bland, and it's possible be, that's because Taurosaurus is a bit bland compared to other Ceratopsians. It does. The one thing it has going for it is the huge, amazing frill, and again, it is a little undersized here. So that's it's understated, and that could be more so. But what this makes up for from that is in the patterning, which I really like basically every color variant of this. And in the behaviors, it doesn't do the, the head thing that Pentaceratops does, but the way that they fight one another and the way that it sleeps. Really, I think if I hadn't seen those two things, this would have been an A for me. But those two things combined with the fact that this is otherwise a very solid design push it up into S tier for me, but not as high in S tier as Styracosaurus. Comfortable yeah. with that. Uh, yeah, that's fair. I'm comfortable with that. Now, but Dalton, before I change over to my screen when we'll rank it and we'll spin that wheel, mm-hmm. can you make it sleep here? I want to see it again. <gasps> Let me see. Oh. You can. Oh, no. Oh, my God. It's well behaved. Oh, <laughs> my gentleman. He's this so reminds sweet. me of, like, Dinotopia. I feel like there's a, a, a particular painting in Dinotopia where there's a Ceratopsian kind of contemplating and sitting like this. Oh, oh my goodness. All right, let's spin this wheel. Wait, is he going to bed? Oh. He's going to bed. We go bed. Oh, oh my face 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 face. God. Ooh. And the itchy chin. This is That's so perfect and precious. Really good. This is very right. nice. S tier. All right, everybody. So in that case, we can comfortably rate Taurosaurus if I can find it. Down, left. Keep going. Nope. To the right. No, to Bottom the left. Row. Bottom row. Jesus Christ. Oh, my God. No. What? Oh, I see, I see it now. I see it now. Taurosaurus as S tier. Woo! All right. And without further ado, let's spin that wheel. Spin, spin that wheel. Spin. Spin the wheel. Spin. Oh, spin the wheel. Wheel! Spin in the wheel. Ding, 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 No. Are we gonna, oh. Oh my god! We don't have to talk about ontogeny. We don't have to talk about ontogeny tomorrow night or next week. Did you just see all of our, just like, hearts just... We're not ready for Stitchy Moloch yet, please God. Oh, thank God. All right, yeah, we can talk about a fucking. Please do so. That'll be fun. And a good yeah. one, too. And yeah, bioluminescence, but... too. This and then I fun. also had a very dyslexic moment there of, like, I thought we took Styracosaurus. No, off no, the Scott. Wheel. Scott, Scott, I thought the same thing. Hey, it's <laughs> contagious. Oh, my All right, God. we're done recording. Yeah. I'm leaving. Bye. All right, goodbye, Alex. <laughs> we're, we're... I'm gonna, if Dalton, if you don't see me home in like 10 minutes, I have been mugged. Let's see you all <laughs> next week, folks. Thanks for watching. Bye, everybody. Bye. Like and subscribe. Bye. Bye. <laughs>